Um, welcome to um, uh, the next session. We are um, going to be uh, discussing the difficulties of forecasting the next big macro risk. Um, I have uh, four speakers here with me to discuss uh, this question. Um, going from this side, I have David Adkins, the head of investment strategy for Lloyd's Banking Group. Um, Simon Lee, oh, no. Uh, I have Elizabeth Fernando, <laughs> the Head of Equities at uh, the University Superannuation Scheme. Uh, on this side, I have Simon Lee, uh, who is the uh, Head of the Marks and Spencer Pensions Trust um, and Chief Investment Officer for the schemes. Um, and uh, I have Lucy McDonald, uh, the Chief Investment Officer for Global Equities at Allianz Global Investors. We're going to kick off the session uh, by making use of uh, the um, question app that you will all have on your phones if you go to the, the conference app. Um, we're going to uh, start, I think, by um, just trying to get a handle on what kind of audience we've got here today. Uh, so um, we're going to ask you to please say whether you're a scheme trustee, uh, a pensions manager, or another scheme employee. Um, an asset manager, uh, an investment consultant, or any other kind of pension service provider. Um, so if you'd like to get your apps out and vote now, I think we'll have a, a few seconds for that to happen. Okay. Right. Oh, well, we have the pension schemes are well represented here. Um, more than, oh, yeah, definitely more than half of you, almost two thirds of you. Um, uh, pensions managers as well. Yeah, and, and about 15% asset managers, 17% there. Oh, no, 19%. <laughs> it's, a, it's a movable feast, exactly. Um, but yeah, okay, well, that's good to know. Um, all right, if we can close that question now. Um, uh, the, we'll, we'll ask you a second question as well, um, which will get us kicked off on today's discussion, uh, which is basically for your assessment of what the most critical risk facing investors at the moment is. Um, so uh, we're going to discuss first um, the general sort of uh, macroeconomic environment at the end of the economic cycle, perhaps um, interest rates rising um, and the risks of, uh, of, of, of um, uh, central banks withdrawing the stimulus policies they've been about for the last 10 years. Um, more broadly than that, I suppose um, you might feel that uh, the longevity and, and demographics, as we were hearing about in the previous session, is a bigger risk. Um, and we have the risk of climate change, of course. Um, and then and finally, um, Donald Trump uh, on the march with his uh, uh, trade embargoes. <coughs> Um, so, yeah, populist politics in general, I suppose. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty evenly spread, with the exception that people aren't that worried about climate change. Um, perhaps it's just a little too distant and far off. Um, but, yeah, apart from that, about a third each. Okay. All right, well, we'll see if we can change your minds. Um, Okay, fine. So, well, we'll start off, I think, by uh, just going through the panel um, and getting uh, each speaker to introduce themselves in a little bit more detail than I did um, and give us a little bit uh, on their attitude to risk and how they handle it. Um, so, yeah, David, maybe you can kick us off. Yeah, sure. So, the Lloyds Banking Group Pension Trustee uh, oversees the three largest schemes sponsored by the Lloyds Banking Group. Uh, collectively, that's assets of approximately 40 billion, all of which is managed externally by third-party fund managers. Uh, the broad asset allocation is roughly three quarters in LDI and various forms of credit investment. Um, very little, in fact, in equities, less than 10% of the portfolio in equities. And the trustee has an ambition to be fully funded on a fairly conservative de definition of liabilities by the mid-2030s, and so when it thinks about risk, it looks through the prism of failing to achieve that objective when it thinks about risk. 
Um, Elizabeth? Um, so I'm, I'm sure the university superannuation scheme, USS, doesn't need much introduction to an audience like this. Um, but we are the, uh, the pension provider for the higher education sector in the UK. We have about 60 billion in assets under management. Uh, we currently have a hybrid scheme where we offer DB uh, benefits up to a maximum salary threshold of £55,000 and DC beyond that. I'm sure you are all very aware that we currently have a consultation ongoing about where that salary cap can be set um, so that the, the DB promise can be sustainably um, maintained um, or the pension promise as a whole can be sustainably maintained given current um, market conditions. The, my role at USS as, as head of equities is um, I run a team of 25 individuals. Uh, we actively manage our equity portfolio internally. It's about £25 billion. Pounds. Um, and we invest in a range of research-driven portfolios as well as um, some factor strategies. Um, for me, risk isn't about mark-to-market um, price volatility. Um, it's all about not delivering the investment returns that we need to pay those benefits to our members in an affordable and sustainable manner. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, Simon? Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, as, as, as the, um, Mark introduced me, I'm uh, head of the Pension Trust and also CIO for the MS um, scheme. Um, in that, um, I'm supported by a talented and uh, when they're not busy watching this live stream, hard working team who um, <laughs> support me and the trustee in managing all the risks within the scheme. Um, I think as a, the scheme itself is about £10 billion worth of assets, all externally managed and we have about 116,000 members um, of whom uh, about 55,000 are pensioners and the remainder deferred um, because having closed the scheme to new uh, joiners in 2002, the scheme was closed to future accrual in 2017. Um, we look at risk very holistically and very much within the regulator's integrated risk management framework. So investment risk is just one of the risks which we would um, look at as well as um, crucially funding risk and um, also employer covenant. And um, to do that we have um, obviously a series of trustee committees who work and support the board. Investment risk sits with the investment committee um, and the active element of the assets is essentially about 30% of the assets which sit in a growth assets portfolio. Um, that's an extremely diversified set of equities, credit and alternatives. Uh, and it's managed against a return target set by the investment committee. And when we think about risk in that uh, extent, we think about risk very much in volatility terms. Uh, at an overall funding level, we think about risk very much in, in VAR terms still. Um, that's a, a convenient measure both for the company and for the trustee. Um, and we measure our sort of success against a long-term funding uh, target um, at which we are trying to reach a certain probability of being fully funded um, at a certain future dates um, and therefore we use a certain amount of stochastic modelling to, to assess that um, as in fact we reach fully funded on that basis we are beginning to, de to produce some more deterministic triggers uh, and so that's something of a, a work in progress um, but um, it, for a scheme that's really heavily de-risked it's, it's very important for us to focus on the, the high level um, funding risk and in fact investment risk is a, a smaller subset of that. Okay. Right, and and uh, Lucy, you must have a slightly different perspective uh, coming from an asset manager. Yeah, we are um, as, uh, a large diversified asset manager um, with fixed interest, multi-asset uh, and, and now infrastructure and alternatives as well as equities. My area is equities. Um, we have about um, 200 investment professionals uh, who are managing equity portfolios of regional. My area is global, and we have about six billion of global equities, which um, uh, we run from London and with our analysts around the world. A risk for us is, is not delivering on our clients' objectives, whatever those happen to be. Most of them are, are relative to indices still. Uh, but within um, our investment process, what we see as risk is a permanent reduction in capital value. Um, we spend time obviously looking at volatility and looking at tracking errors, but at the end of the day, 
that is minor compared to actually losing money in a permanent sense. Well, um, I think uh, a common theme appears to be um, uh, losing capital value. Um, so we should probably turn to some of the things that might cause that to happen and what we might do about it. Uh, so um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go through um, in the order that we ask you uh, the questions and then at the end you can see whether you've changed your mind or not. Um, so the first one uh, is um, the, the, the overall macroeconomic situation. Um, uh, as I sort of said, um, it seems to many people like, or it seems to me anyway, that we're sort of at a kind of a tipping point for financial markets. Um, central banks ending their quantitative easing program, um, interest rates rising, uh, particularly in the US, um, and at the same time we have uh, an increase in, in populist politics in many parts of the world. Um, so I'd like to ask the panel basically about how they see all of that. Um, and what steps they're taking to insulate their investments against these risks. Um, Simon, do you want to okay. come in first? Okay, fine, thank you. Um, I, I don't think uh, any of us would deny that we, we live in really interesting and um, almost extraordinary times. And, and certainly if we think about interest rates, we most definitely do. Um, you know, it's been an extremely long time since interest rates have globally been so low in so many countries. Um, indeed, you probably have to go back to the second half of around the 14th century um, for that to happen. And you'll appreciate that that was largely a consequence of, of the Black Death in Europe in 1348, um, which had several implications, one of which was, of course, that it wiped out about half the population. Uh, and it also um, uh, resulted in you know, an absolute destruction of the, the nascent economies which were in place at that time. Um, it would probably be interesting and maybe even entertaining to um, debate further the sort of concepts and the possibilities of uh, what might befall us if we entered into a sort of Mad Max style dystopia. But um, uh, David Davis has informed us that that's not going to be the case. So um, unfortunately, I'm stuck with the end of QE. Um, We've got a session tomorrow um, on this, this particular subject at which um, I know um, Megan Green from Hancock and uh, David Miles, formerly the, the MPC, and Robert Waugh of Royal Bank are all going to speak, and they're probably all far more qualified to speak on this subject than I am. Um, but there's no getting away from the fact that you know, we are in a, a point at which um, QE has largely run its course and we are beginning to see the end of, of QE. It's been very hard for central banks, however, despite um, reasonably sustained global growth, um, to, to begin to make this transition, um, because they've learned as much as anything else that they have to be so careful um, in both the communications which they give and also the actions which they take. And we only have to go back to May 2013 and the, the taper tantrum um, to see the impact that can happen when central banks begin to even suggest that they might start um, normalising interest rates or reducing the stimulus. Um, and certainly the implications of the, the market corrections which we saw earlier in the year were driven largely by um, a certain amount of recognition that future inflation might be higher than anticipated and the read through into therefore potentially faster um, rises in interest rates. Um, nonetheless, you know, from a, from a perspective of the UK, it's no great surprise that the Bank of England is, is, is at least talking about rates going up because we are in a position where unemployment is near 40-year lows and inflation is, is well above the 2% CPI target which the bank has. Um, from a pension scheme perspective, and certainly a DB pension scheme perspective, the implication of a rise in rates, notwithstanding the potential impact it would have on cap rates and hence on asset, and asset values, is also, of course, clearly on the liabilities of the scheme and our funding levels. Um, for a scheme like ours, which is heavily hedged against interest rates, uh, we'll see relatively limited benefit from uh, a rise in rates. Uh, and, and the rise in rates which we are beginning to see with UK 15-year gilts now at 175, which is almost a quarter percent up from where they were um, at the beginning of the year. Um, but we will, what one benefit we will find, as all schemes will find, of course, is that the actual overall value of the scheme liabilities and the scheme will be smaller relative to the size of the sponsor. And that's actually quite a helpful development because one of the biggest problems we all face is the fact that schemes have become so outsized compared with their sponsors. Um, and finally, 
Um, I suppose the other implication, and one that we shouldn't lose sight of um, in trying to, to manage the risks in a DB pension scheme, is actually the impact that a rise in rates might have on underlying sponsors and the covenant which they provide. Um, clearly, if you're in David's position and you've got a bank as your sponsor, a little bit of rise in rates is probably slightly helpful, not least of which because interest margins might um, expand a bit, and also because a, a steepening yield curve will also help because with the maturity transformation which banks do, um, that will become greater there'll be some greater profitability potentially from that. But um, if you've got a retailer as your sponsor, it's obviously slightly more challenging um, because a, a rise in rates in a largely indebted um, nation tends to uh, suppress uh, consumer demand. Oh, okay. Well, um, it's probably a good time to bring David in to talk a little bit about this. Um, uh, if, if, if uh, in particular, if, if uh, rates are rising, then that's probably because inflation is rising, uh, and, and I'm going to guess that like that's um, going to affect the way you invest. I mean, what? How would you? Sort yeah, of I certainly would pick up on that inflation theme and, and really break that into two because there's there's a difference between sort of near-term inflation outcomes, which we've seen quite recently, and and sort of then longer-term um, inflation expectations. So. I, I think the US sort of wage inflation statistic is probably the most watched statistic in the world at present because it's a, it's a sign that investors are looking at to see how often the Federal Reserve will raise interest rates in the US and, and, and just, you know, we saw that four weeks ago with the market volatility that concern that wage inflation would rise faster than expected really did feed through into some market wobbles which naturally impacted asset prices. But probably the more dangerous risk if, is if that feeds into long-term inflation expectations. So here in the UK, RPI, which is still probably the most common measure for pension increase, pension increases in UK schemes, RPI is still around about 3.5% as far as a long-term expectation is concerned. Now if that starts to rise, then that really will hit uh, liabilities. I mean, a one percentage point increase in inflation expectations would probably equate to something like another 10 to 20 percent onto your liabilities, um, which is obviously a, a you know, seriously impairs your balance sheet if, if, if you're not hedged. So what are we doing about that? Well, we are hedged fully on inflation risk. Um, we're also seeing within our credit portfolios, we're also sort of seeing a gradual shift to sort of more floating rate um, credit instruments which take the duration out of the portfolio so that we're not exposed to the sort of unintended consequences of, of, of yields rising. So yeah, that's how we're trying to mitigate that. Would, would everyone just kind of briefly agree, if you like, that, that then maybe the, the return of inflation does not mean take off your hedges? Certainly not, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Um, okay, well, um, uh, I'll bring in Elizabeth now to maybe talk about a little bit more about um, kind of more regional risks, um, the markets um, uh, in different parts of the world. So um, the, is the Eurozone crisis solved? Uh, and and um, you've done some work on China as well, I think. Yeah, yeah, we have. Maybe taking the, the Eurozone um, first. And, and I guess our concern there is that um, this current period of calm that we're going through in the Eurozone um, could be mistaken for a belief that the problems that we have had in um, the Eurozone back in 2010, 2011 <coughs> have been solved. And, and we don't think that is, is the case. At the moment, we're going through a rare period where um, we've got synchronized growth in, in all the Eurozone economies. And that is papering over a number of cracks, which still fundamental cracks, which still exist in the Eurozone structure. Um, to, to make the, um, and, and as the tide goes out, if we do have um, a slowdown in growth, that some of those will be exposed and we will um, end back, um, back in a, a crisis situation. The two things that we think would solve that are um, a common fiscal policy, um, which there is some muttering about. Um, it was talk about having a, a European finance minister. Um, I am sceptical about whether or not um, that is really what uh, electorates want. Um, if you look at the way that parties, people have been vot voting in recent polls, it, they don't appear to be voting for, for um, 
less sovereignty. They seem to be voting generally for, for more sovereignty. Um, so the, the politicians might like the idea of having a central fiscal policy, but I'm not sure that um, the electorate will, will actually back that. And then the second thing I think we really need um, is some kind of banking union, or at the very least a deposit guarantee scheme. Because if we think back to the 2011 crisis, the, the negative feedback loop we got between sov uh, sovereign risk and then the bank um, sector risk was really what turned something that could have been quite manageable into something really quite um, shocking. If you look at the target two balances um, from the ECB, it's pretty clear that um, Italian and, and Spanish savers would still rather have a German euro than a domestic euro of their own. And that tells me that they still don't trust their own domestic financial system. And until we end up in a situation where one euro is a euro, and they're all worth the same, I think we, you know, we ought to be on nervous, um, nervous ground. Generally, Europe only makes changes in the midst of a crisis, yes. which unfortunately probably needs, means we need to have another crisis before we're going to get the changes we need to, um, to make those structural changes, if indeed people are committed to doing them. Yeah. On, on China, very briefly, um, I would actually be less concerned about that than, than many people are, um, largely because, yes, there are some clear strains building in that economy, um, but the authorities seem to be navigating um, those, um, those potential traps really quite well at the moment. And uh, we did some work using um, an econometric model um, by uh, a team called uh, C CMR. Um, it's a model the IMF also use. It looks at the interconnectedness between economies. And people, I think, still overestimate the, um, the amount of interconnectedness between Chinese GDP and GDP in um, particularly developed Western economies, the US, really? Europe. It has been increasing over time. That's clear. It will continue to increase as um, China plays a bigger part in the world. But it's really the ASEAN economies that would be most impacted by a hard landing in, um, in China. It's pretty clear that financial markets would take a hell of a knock um, in the morning that we walked in and we found out that something awful had unfolded. But the, the CMR model also suggests that although it would be very short and very sharp, we would bounce back very quickly and we would get back to um, previous levels um, in fairly short order. The things we're looking at to um, make sure that we're not being complacent on this are um, debt, specifically the um, rate of growth in debt and the sources of funding supporting that. Uh, we're looking at the currency and the rate of growth in um, assets in the economy compared to the rate of growth in foreign exchange reserves because with a fixed peg uh, currency that um, you need the two growing together for long and boring reasons I can get into not here. Um, demographics, uh, productivity, so whether capital is being allocated um, for political reasons or for economic reasons, it's pretty important it's done for economic reasons. And then the final one is this One Belt, one belt, one Road um, initiative where China is trying to extend its sphere of political influence and um, it could start bumping into some other regional powers who may not like that encroachment onto their natural territory. Um, so there I'm thinking about India, thinking about Japan, thinking about Russia. Um, the US clearly used to be very sensitive. It's not yet clear how um, sensitive they will be under a, under a Trump administration. Okay. So, um, uh, Lucy, maybe you can, with a, with a global perspective, maybe you can give us um, a, a bit of an overview. Um, uh, in particular, kind of, um, you know, do you think that, uh, that there's a, a risk we might have um, you know, more in the way of uh, tension between the regional economies, um, possible trade wars, um, the rise of China, as we've been hearing? Um, how do you sort of see the world? Well, as, as far as, as trade wars concerned, clearly that there is more of risk now to that. So that's something we've got to, to watch extremely carefully. And the, the only person who thinks that trade war is a good thing is President Trump. Nobody else does. And all the evidence is that it's a bad thing for growth, it's bad for inflation. So I think we need to keep an eye on that and, and uh, see how it develops. But uh, on, on the other subject we talked about, on um, debt, which I think we've spoken about um, 
from the Chinese and the European point of view, um, that really is still the biggest issue behind everything. And the fact that the level of debt in the, the global system is higher now as a proportion of GDP than it was before the financial crisis, and that has is risen as a result of the financial crisis, but it's also uh, Chinese debt has, has risen, and now corporate debt has also risen um, in the US in particular, um, back to relatively high levels. So, so that is still means there's a lot of potential fragility in the system as the liquidity begins to come out. So I think we just need to remain aware that that is in the background. And then secondly, on inflation, which, which we touched on, um, it's an interesting time for inflation because you do have some very long-term structural downward pressures on inflation which have been keeping it down over the last few years. And there, some of those are still there, and one of those is the debt. Uh, demographics, which we've spoken about, is still a downward pressure. Um, and then there's technology, which we don't know exactly what the impact is, but we do think that it seems to be having a, a downward pressure on, on wages over the longer term. So th those are all still there. But in the shorter term, you've got more cyclical um, upward pressure now beginning to come on wages. Um, just small, but beginning to come through from a cyclical perspective, just because of the level of unemployment. And you've also got a bit more upward pressure from commodity prices, and that's partly due to the reduction of capacity in some of these commodities in China. So you've had big capacity taken out of the system in China, and that's leading to a little bit more support for commodity prices. So you've got a more messy picture in the short term for inflation. So I think it's going to be pretty unclear for the next six months or so which of those is going to be really driving. It looks like the cyclical might have a little bit more influence. So that's on, on inflation. And then lastly, on uh, overall, what do we think uh, all is going to mean for capital returns in markets? Well, it looks like we are in this year seeing peak liquidity, peak growth, and possibly peak valuations as well. And the peak liquidity is, you know, as we've spoken about, is, is the end of QE in, in the uh, US. You've still got it coming in Europe. You've still got it coming in Japan. Mm. But overall, it looks like you're going to be peaking this year and interest rates starting to creep up in, um, in the US. So that's an environment where it's going to be more difficult for all asset prices to keep rising. Um, so the question is, can they stay where they are? Secondly, on growth, it looks like we are having peak growth both in e uh, the economies but also in corporate profits because you've got a huge boost to corporate profits this year in the US from tax reform. So that's coming through. So you've got a very, very strong corporate profits this year, which is not going to be repeated in 2019. And then as far as valuations are concerned, well, you know, they are at the high levels. I mean, I think there's no debate about that. But, uh, on a historic basis, valuations of, of all asset classes are, are quite high, and it's been supported while you've had interest rates where they are. But as interest rates creep up, there's not going to be so much support. So from all of those perspectives, I think it's not ridiculous to say that going forward, you're not going to get 10 to 15 percent returns in markets that we've had over the last, you know, since the financial crisis. Uh, so therefore, it's a question of how much less are you going to get. And I think it's much more likely you're going to get more moderate returns and we've begun to see higher volatility. Just back to normal levels, that's fine. So if you get normal uh, returns, normal volatility, that will do us fine. But, you know, that's the question. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, yeah, it, it's, interesting. it's interesting that uh, a lot of the speakers mentioned the theme of, of debt. Um, uh, debt is, of course, fundamentally uh, borrowing from tomorrow. Um, and uh, so, I mean, I think we should probably address the question of um, essentially like the way, the different way in which the population is changing. Um, we obviously heard from Amanan uh, in the last session about a lot about this, um, but I was kind of quite keen to, because we've got investors on the panel, um, to sort of ask everyone uh, how they're thinking about this, the, 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 the aging population are changing demographics, and whether it's a risk for pensions, uh, or whether it's an opportunity, or you know, what the balance between those two things are. So um, uh, David, do you want to come in first on this? Yeah, sure. So a couple of thoughts in this area. If we start with um, longevity risk, um, so as, as I say, uh, our schemes are trying to reach a conservative definition of funding uh, by the mid-2030s and uh, a lot of schemes are trying to do the same. What most of you will be familiar with is the phrase of being self-sufficient, whether that's ultimately trying to buy out the liabilities with insure or to run it off uh, in-house. Now, that is, uh, that's a twofold test. That's first of all acquiring enough assets to meet that definition of liabilities. It also means 
when you get there, that you close down on risk such that you're unlikely to call upon uh, the employer at a future point in time. Closing down on risk means addressing four areas, and most of which a lot of schemes will have addressed or be addressing. So there's asset price risk. So um, as schemes funding levels improve, um, a lot of trustees with the help of their advisors have put in place de-risking triggers. So as the funding level improves, money will be taken out of equities, put into bonds and LDI and so forth, and that will manage asset uh, price risk down over time. Uh, interest rate risk and inflation risk uh, I mentioned earlier. Um, we're fully hedged, a lot of other schemes are in that position or on that journey as well, uh, which means that three out of the four key risks have largely been addressed by a lot of schemes. The fourth is longevity risk. So in other words, the risk that members live longer than expected, which puts a further strain on, on the scheme's finances. And very broadly, a sort of one in 20 type stress will add about 25% to the value of the scheme's liabilities over the scheme's lifetime. Again, a very significant number and a very significant strain on your balance sheet if that event were to materialise. Um, so I think this is one area that a lot of trustees have yet to start to think about. Um, obviously there have been some pioneers in this space. Some schemes have approached the longevity hedging market. Um, but if you do want to uh, eventually call yourself self-sufficient from your sponsoring employer, you will have to address the longevity risk issue at some point in time. I think the other, the other twist to this from a demographic perspective is certainly in the financial sector we're seeing a lot of members who've yet to reach retirement take their cash equivalent transfer value out of DB and put it into a DC environment, sort of fueled by sort of low interest rates, um, putting a higher capital value on their, on, on their pension promise. What does that mean? Well, from the scheme's point of view, um, risk is going out the door. The, the longevity risk associated with that member, the asset risk, the interest rate risk and so forth. So risk is going out the door in that perspective. But from, from a scheme's perspective, it puts liquidity risk onto the agenda. So in other words, you, know, you as trustees have to have a plan in place to sort of manage the amount of money that is going out the door and be prepared uh, to have the cash ready so the administrator can write the checks when members want to take it on to their next scheme. Okay. Um, so, do you have any longevity hedges on? No, I mean, uh, but we would we would echo. I mean, I'd echo very much David's those comments. I mean, I, I think it's it's important to recognise that that UK DB schemes, you know, the, the issue of longevity is absolutely acute for us because we have this statutory indexation of benefits, and therefore it's it's a real problem, not a nominal one. And 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 if we had a way of um, uh, resolving that it would be more helpful, but, but it's it, absolutely the case where if you, if you have a scheme that's reasonably mature where you have slowly but surely de-risked other elements of, of your overall risk space, and many of us have been able to do so because we've had you know, a number of, 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 of tailwinds since particularly 2009 where we've had you know, equity markets and real assets performing extremely well over a long period of time. Um, we've also had you know, some benefits from a funding perspective, as David says, um, relating to transfers out. I mean, obviously from a, a scheme-specific perspective, we've seen much lower level of, of transfers out than, than, say, the banks and the financial services schemes have seen, but that's because you know, the IFAs have kind of gone where the money is. Um, and we don't have, you know, we've got a very uh, skewed um, liability, I guess, um, when you look at our profile, because we've got an awful lot of small benefits, because we have a lot of part-time, unfortunately, typically female members, and we have a small number of, of longer service um, people in the scheme. But, but that, that hasn't happened so much. But it is very much the case that the longevity risk is, is rel in relative terms, therefore, a very, very large one that schemes want to address. And um, it's been you know, helpful, I guess, for schemes to see the insurance market beginning to develop. And it's obviously developed quite fast. Um, picking up on the demographic points, um, yeah, I think that's that's one which it was you know it was obviously very helpful having Amman's session before because it is you know clear that if you are a long-term investor as we are, um, the demographics are going to continue to change. They've changed dramatically in the last in the last you know of my lifetime. You know, from from probably average age in the UK has gone up from about 35 in the mid 60s to to a 40, 41 now. Um, but it's the crucial elements is, is the proportion of working population as well as, as the proportion are over 65 or, or in, a, in an area where they might become dependent. Um, and I think we, we need to look, if we're investing over a you know, 20, 20, 25 year time horizon, 
um, looking forward, we need to think about the sort of society that, that the UK or other, other entities, other countries we might invest in look like in that point. And we have all of us a, um, uh, something of a, um, a helpful, um, a, a instructive piece in being able to look at Japan, which obviously has uh, these, these issues in spades. Um, but uh, if you look at the statistics, I mean, an awful lot of the developed world will look very much more like Japan in, in not so far into the future. And therefore, you know, there's clearly going to be much less demand for credit. Um, but there will be much greater demand for health care and for long-term care. And I think, like many schemes, you know, where we're looking for long-dated, um, relatively secure cash flows, um, we are already seeing um, those arising in those sorts of areas. Well, I mean, that's a good point to, to, to bring in, Lucy. I mean, uh, should, should we all be investing in healthcare stocks? Uh, selectively. I think, yeah. uh, there, uh, clearly, there are some areas uh, which... Um, have been very strong within healthcare. So where you get a volume um, without concerns about price, so some of the healthcare, the you know, medical equipment, that, that still looks to be seeing some quite good volume growth. That will continue, body parts, you know, we're all going to need them. Um, and then the other area, which is, is very um, strong, I think will continue to be strong, um, is, is um, the healthcare services, which are helping to bring the overall cost of of um, healthcare under control around the world because it is completely out of control in the US, but elsewhere is it needs needs to be managed. So the managed care companies, which are able to use their scale to buy in, keep you know, drug prices down, keep service prices down, um, and then deliver that benefit, I think those are still going to be good good places to be. Okay. Well. Um I want to move on the discussion a little, um, and I did want to talk um, about uh, climate change um, and the risk there to, to everyone's portfolios. Now, I know um, in, the, in the voting, uh, not many people thought it was a, a big risk, but um, unfortunately, the politicians begged to disagree with you. Um, just at the start of this week, I think it was the MPs on the Environmental Audit Committee uh, sent letters to the UK's 25 largest pension funds um, asking them how they're going to be tackling this risk to their member savings. So um, I'd like to start off by asking the funds on the panel, um, did, you, did you get a letter and how are you responding, uh, Elizabeth? We, we did get a letter <laughs> um, and we will be responding. Um, no, I mean, I, I have to admit, I was slightly surprised, I guess I was slightly surprised that so few people thought that um, climate change was um, a, a big macro risk. Um, I, th I suspect there's something in there about time frames, um, in that some of these other issues we've been talking about are much more immediate and they're things we're more comfortable with forecasting. Um, but I think climate risk potentially could be the single biggest risk to all of our investment portfolios. There will be opportunities that come out of it as well, but th there really are some um, quite significant um, areas of concern. and. Um, as we adapt to, um, to the changing in, in environment, our it, capital investments patterns are going to have to change and inevitably that's going to create winners and losers. A, a lot of what we've talked about um, in general about um, climate risks so far has been in the public equity space. There is an enormous amount being written, I'm sure Lucy's inbox is as flooded as mine is at the moment, with notes about ESG integration, about climate risk, about carbon. Um, but I really wonder whether or not we have genuinely put those um, issues into our financial models. Whether we have thought about the impact of, on growth, whether we've thought, thought about the impact on margins, on cash flows, and therefore on the kind of sustainable returns we can expect from assets going forward, I suspect we haven't. Um, and I think secretly a lot of people are hoping that governments won't get their act together and that they won't impose an effective carbon price on us. They won't impose an effective um, water price on us. Um, but if we are going to tackle the, the climate change challenge, I think that they are going to have to. Um, as I say, we've been very focused on public equities so far. When people carbon footprint, they generally carbon footprint their public equity portfolio. They tend not to look at, at other asset classes. Um, but I think we're going to have to broaden our horizons here a bit because it's not clear to me if you think that um, an oil and gas company or an auto company is a poor investment from the equity point of view, why you would want to be giving them long-term debt funding. Yeah, it seems very inconsistent to me. And I think um, expanding the thinking to 
Credit markets is a very obvious thing to do. Expanding it to private equity, private credit is a very obvious thing to do. We have much less good data on coming from the private equity, private credit side about the carbon emissions, um, the water consumption from, from those investments. We need more information um, there. But we also need to start thinking about um, some of our real estate assets, some of our infrastructure assets. Because if we get um, rising sea levels um, with warmer temperatures, if we get population migration away from coasts and um, potentially away from, um, thinking larger scale, away from the equator towards the, uh, the poles, you, you could find that the, some of these assets that you are sitting on are no longer so valuable because the population centre has moved. You have a shopping centre that no longer has um, a, a large uh, town or city around it. It's moved 30, 30 miles further up, up the coast, and, and your asset is, is now not worth anything. Um, so I think broadening out that, um, that perspective is, is going to be very important. I, th I think my final um, point on why I think this is, is going to be a, an enormous risk for us is that it involves um, volatility. So more extreme weather events, as I say, changing patterns of where investment, capital investment takes place, potential population migration, all introduces volatility and uncertainty into our forecast horizons. The one thing we know markets do not like is uncertainty, and it's going to make life quite difficult for the insurers. Um, to know which risks to take on, and it's probably going to make the cost of us buying insurance against risks um, more expensive. And yeah, so I think it, potentially it's a, it's a very, very broad reaching uh, risk to our portfolios. Well, um, I mean, obviously, you guys have a very um, uh, large and sophisticated investment team uh, and can do a lot of this analysis. Um, I'm just wondering, like, um, I mean, there's been a lot of kind of public pressure and you know pressure groups and, and so on and so forth um, arguing for sort of quite simplistic but you know possibly easier solutions for um, you know because they're smaller investors who don't have the resource to do this kind of analysis. Um, for example, you know just outright selling out of dirty coal stocks or whatever. I mean, do, do, the panel in general, do we think that's that kind of approach is, is too crude or is it a sensible it's, it's thing It's what to our do? parent has suggested that we should do some, some years ago, so, so not, not crude at all, very sensible. <laughs> um, but I, I, I think, um, actually, joking aside, the insurance industry has had to really face this as a, a bit of an existential threat um, years ago, and so have really been quite uh, on the front foot about their thinking. Mm -hmm. And so being owned by an insurer now, you know, looking at the, the most of the, of the top 10 in the um, asset owners dis disclosure project on climate change, there's legal in general there, there is Aviva in there, you know, we're in there. Because our parents are very aware of it and have been pushing this down into the asset management mm -hmm. so that we've been thinking about it, we've been um, analysing it, um, you know, doing you know, carbon pr um, footprints. And also the fact that we've got an ownership in, in uh, Germany, which is sort of also on the front foot on this issue. Um, we have many clients in France who are very you know, tuned into this. So I, I think that helps to, um, to get the, the thinking through the organisation. And, and I was quite surprised it came out so, so low as well. And I think one reason may be because it's such a huge existential threat and we're not sure how long it's going to go uh, to, you know, we know something's changing, but it's very difficult to, to really get our, our minds around what it means for our industry. So I think people tend to think it's too big to actually do anything with. Yeah, yeah, but uh, it, yeah. you know, it, to me, it's just it, part of the overall risks that we're looking at when we're investing in companies. I think, yeah, I think, I think you, you might see it rise up people's agendas if, if you get climate change risks sort of morphing into legislative list, uh, risk. So um, I'm thinking of the example, was it last year, that uh, from about 2040 you will no longer be able to buy a petrol or a diesel car in this country. Yeah. Now, we will go through many changes in governments before yeah. 2040, but if that situation materialises, then that has obviously huge implications for the car industry, yeah. for the fossil fuel industry. Yeah. And I think, I think active management is actually probably the best solution for, for this sort of, for managing this sort of risk because um, the best global equity managers out there that I see are tending to avoid the sort of the energy sector either completely or in, in part 
partly because they don't want to take a punt on the oil price and secondly because they're concerned about technological disruption in this area. Yeah, yeah, right. um, uh, so you, you uh, well, I think, I think that the, the, the point I'd probably pick up is, which, um, which Elizabeth mentioned earlier, was, was the point that actually it's very important to, to try and move this debate slightly away from being purely an equity debate yeah. and, and possibly too much, in, you know, too much of the the, the past history in this has been very much around listed equities and, and, and from a you know, DB pension scheme perspective, and maybe this is one of the other reasons why it scored relatively lowly, um, you know, we, we tend to lend money to companies now rather than, in, than invest in them. That, that actually means it's far more important that we understand this because you know, I, I'm not so worried about whether, it, you know, just, you know, whether their business plan doesn't hit their targets in the next three years. I want to be paid back in 15 years' time and I need the business to still be there and still be big enough to do that. So we are very focused on thinking about, you know, is this a sustainable business, but I, I'm, I'm pleased to see that there is a greater focus on, on, on credit and on, on, on other long-dated assets because increasingly from a pension scheme perspective, they're the things we're going to invest in. And if we keep regarding this as an equity issue because it's easier for equity holders to, to take action either by voting or by, 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 di by selling the assets, then um, I think we begin to miss the point slightly. Yeah, okay. Well, all right. Well, we've, that was a fairly kind of brisk gallop through uh, most of the, uh, the three of these big risks that um, investors face. Um, we've got some time now for questions uh, from the floor um, or from the uh, live uh, web stream audience as well. So, um, if uh, I, I hope there's some microphones uh, available, um, but uh, yeah, does anyone have a question for the panel? Yeah, I'll give a gentleman over there. Thanks. Uh, Jonathan Maiden Smith, London Borough of Hackney. Um, it's a question for Simon. I think you said that the investment committee looks at investment risk. Do you think that's appropriate or does that encourage further group oh. think? Oh, okay. No, uh, thank you for that. That's, good. that's a really good question. Um, the, the investment committee is primarily responsible to the trustee board for management of investment risks, but to, to deal with that particular point that you don't want people marking their own homework, um, in the same way that we have a management and governance committee which looks after the administration and governance aspects of the scheme and looks after those risks, um, we have a uh, finance audit and risk committee which is responsible for the overall risk budget and essentially um, that's the body through which um, those risks are pushed out to the underlying operational committees and then they then receive the, the responses back and they're able to ensure that um, those risks are being properly addressed. It also enables them to link properly with internal audit and also the, the external audit um, to make that work. But the, the, the rationale behind that is to try and move um, the legwork there away from the board itself and to make that work, work more effectively. But no, that's, that's how we try to do it. But you're absolutely right. We need to ensure, um, A, we need to ensure we've got the appropriate people on those committees to be able to have the the appropriate skills to be able to assess those risks, but we are, as much as possible, trying to ensure we get as much diversity as we can onto those committees. I'm extremely fortunate because you know, I have a, a, a trustee board which is very reflective of the membership of my scheme, and therefore um, you know, we've got a, a, a wide variety of people, um, both, you know, we've got a very strong female Part of, part of our board, and we've also got a wide variety of different backgrounds in, in, on the board because clearly the organisation is quite diverse. Um, oh, we have, yes. uh, John Pantor, Greater Manchester Pension Fund. I'm also a USS uh, pensioner as well. I think the <laughs> issues about uh, longevity, uh, we've got to remember what was said before the break you know, and, and not try and lump them together. For instance, Great Manchester Pension Fund, 50% of liabilities come from 11% of the members. The people who are less well paid, of course, die more earlier and more quickly. And we're members of Club Beta and look at the, you know, Club Beta looks at the individual contributions. And I think we've got to get a different approach now <coughs> on longevity, yeah. which reflects, in the case of USS, all these people who don't die in service uh, manage to have fairly uh, good health in, in retirement. And you separate off, of course, the non-academic staff in local pension schemes. So we've got to, I think, have, find a different approach to reflect the, the realities of longevity in the particular membership. I don't think we do that 
enough at the moment, and we may have to look for not going away from some kind of defined benefit, but go for a cap on the proportion of salary that's uh, pensionable, and then leave people above that to go into the market. Okay. Um, uh, I, I, I'm going to bring in one of the questions from online as well here, actually, because it's um, kind of on a similar-ish mm. theme. Um, uh, specifically for you, Simon, uh, the, it's, it's how, basically how has closing the scheme uh, altered your ongoing investment strategy? Um, because the, the makeup of the membership um, is going to change, of course, mm -hmm. um, and perhaps that okay. alters the investment strategy. Sure. Um, no, um, I mean, clearly the, the scheme was closed, as I said, the scheme, scheme was closed to future accrual last year. That only actually affected 11,000 members because they were the 11,000 active members we had in the scheme at the point the scheme was closed on the 1st of April last year. Um, from an investment strategy perspective, the, the, and from a funding perspective, the biggest implication immediately is that we had a 1% salary cap in place and so instead of assuming that those members would then increase at 1% per annum uh, until their normal retirement date, um, they now get of course RPI improvements in, in, in deferment. So in fact we just imported a lot of investment risk into the scheme and we went out and hedged that investment risk, uh, that, that additional inflation risk, um, as soon as we were aware that that was the direction of travel that was definitely going to occur. Um, now that had a cost. Um, but from a, from a perspective of changing the investment strategy, that was the crucial change. Um, did it change the sort of duration of our overall liabilities? Yes, marginally. But you have to remember that if you've got a scheme that closed to new entrants in 2002, um, even if the, the, the staff were as sticky as they might be at M&S, um, you know, the scheme was going, the active members were, were probably declining at about 1,500 per annum anyway. So the scheme would effectively have self-closed itself to, to future accrual in, say, six or seven years so really that just brought that process forward. Okay. Yeah but look, my own experience mm. in this area is scheme closure mm. whether it's to new accrual or to new entrants doesn't change investment strategy overnight you still the members are still there albeit accruing less perhaps than they were but you still got 70 80 years worth of cash flows to manage yeah. uh, it's a slow burning thing. Uh, are there any other questions? Then? Oh just over there. Jennifer Anderson from TPT Retirement Solutions. Um, so there seems to me to be a huge gap between um, what the panel have just described in the level of risk that their schemes or um, organizations um, uh, pose from climate change. Um, and actually uh, some announcements by the UK government this week around the huge, um, mis sorry, sort of <laughs> this sort of widely misunderstood um, link between fiduciary duty and ESG and climate change. So I, it just seems um, concerning to me the kind of very level, uh, low level of understanding around climate risk and ESG within um, trustee boards um, and some of the comments you've just made about the size and complexity that this risk potentially uh, means for our schemes. How do we square that circle? So the, um, the Institute of Actuaries has, has actually very recently um, put out, um, I think it's a, a voluntary notification, I'm going to get the terminology wrong, um, but it's, it has um, suggested to um, all its actuary members that this is something that they should be considering in their advice to um, schemes. Um, and so one would expect, one would hope that the actuaries are going to start considering this as part of their um, assessment of um, appropriate scheme funding and, and scheme risk. Um, I think the other thing I would note is that um, the investment consultants have been um, criticised recently for um, how few of them have signed up to some of the um, climate change initiatives that um, have been launched. There are a few notable exceptions, but um, given how much pressure the consultant industry is under at the moment, I, I would expect them to, um, to step up their game as well and offering advice to, um, to trustee boards on how they can better integrate this into their uh, decision-making processes. I think one of, the, one of the things I get frustrated about is there's this prior assumption that taking ESG into account you know, has some detrimental impact to investment returns, that somehow this inverse relationship exists. I think, I think for myself, you know, responsible investment either reduces risk, enhances return, or some com combination of both. Okay. All right. Um, 
I think we've probably got time for a, 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 one more if it's brief. No? Okay. Well, in that case, um, right, we'll, we're going to go back to the um, uh, original poll question that we asked you um, and see if we've managed to change your mind at all uh, during the session. Um, so, yes, uh, end of cycle macro risks, um, longevity or demographics, climate change, or uh, we, we didn't talk much about uh, the populists, but, uh, but yes, they're still hovering in the background. So, um, yeah, uh, see what you think. Mm -hmm. Ah, Whoa. Oh. oh, there we go. We, we did a good job on climate change, didn't we? Excellent. Okay, yes. Well, <laughs> Yes, well, I think basically what we've done there is we've, we've confused everyone, haven't we? Uh, <laughs> we don't know what risk we should be addressing first. Okay, well, I guess that uh, wraps us up. Um, yeah, so uh, basically, um, I, I, uh, I think there's no, yeah, there's no break after this session, uh, so please stick around. Um, we're going to have uh, an interesting um, address, basically, uh, on um, ensuring value for money uh, in investment management fees. Um, that's featuring Chris Sear, who's the chair of the Institutional Disclosure Working Group, which is the body within the FCA that's actually tasked with, uh, with doing this. So, um, yeah, uh, stick around. Thank you very much to everyone uh, in, in the audience, and thank you very much to uh, our panel. Um, if you could thank them in the normal way. Great. All right. Thank you.